This podcast is brought to you by the IIEA, sharing ideas, shaping policy. Good afternoon and welcome to this very interesting uh, discussion on the on China. We have as our guest speaker today, Dennis Staunton, and I will introduce him formally shortly. Just a few housekeeping issues. The presentation will last 20 minutes and that will be followed by a question and answer session in which you, the audience, uh, can participate by using the Q&A function on your screen. Uh, feel free to follow us uh, using the handle uh, at IIEA on X. Both the presentation and the question and answer are on the record. It gives me very great pleasure to introduce Dennis Staunton, who really doesn't need any introduction. He addressed this forum uh, one year ago, almost exactly. Dennis has been the China correspondent for the Irish Times in Beijing since October 2022. Before that, he was correspondent in London from 2015 and has also worked in Washington, Brussels and in Berlin. He has served also as the foreign editor and the deputy foreign editor of the Irish Times. Dennis, over to you, and we very much appreciate your being available to us today. Thank you, Mary, and uh, thank you to the Institute uh, for inviting me to talk. It's very, very good to be here, and it, it is, as Mary said, uh, almost exactly a year ago since uh, I last spoke uh, to the Institute. And around that time, if we just go back to where we were, China was emerging out of COVID uh, and the zero COVID restrictions have been dropped at the beginning of December. And during December and January, everybody got COVID and then you had Chinese New Year. And as we were coming uh, into the spring, the question really was uh, the, you know, how is the economy going to come back? And also really how was China going to reconnect with the world that it had been more or less cut off from uh, over the previous few years? And so, uh, what happened where the economy was concerned was that there was indeed a rebound, but that uh, the rebound, uh, in a way, it kind of appeared to run out of a certain amount of steam. And uh, so what you had was that uh, you, you had a, a bit of a, a surge and then the overhang of this long running crisis in the property market. Uh, started to, uh, to, to really have a depressing effect. Uh, on the economy and particularly on consumer confidence. And so what, uh, as we moved into the later part of the year, uh, it, uh, you know, economists and the rest of the world and indeed China itself began to be disappointed uh, in terms of the economic performance. The, the economy did grow by more than 5% last year, but still given that it was coming out of, uh, you know, from a fairly low base, you know, that wasn't quite perhaps as impressive as it might have been. They're targeting around 5% for this year. The latest economic figure suggests that they will probably get there or get uh, close enough to it. Also at that time, uh, the relationship between China and the United States was at a particularly low ebb. Uh, the spy balloon had appeared over the US. The US had shot down the spy balloon, and that had really put uh, relations into a kind of a deep freeze. They were already very fraught because uh, the previous August, Nancy Pelosi, who was then the Speaker of the House of Representatives, had visited Taiwan. And in response to that visit, uh, uh, Beijing had uh, conducted military exercises, which involved the encirclement of the island of Taiwan and also the shooting of uh, missiles over the island. And these were pretty scary. And also, uh, you, know, it, it, you know, as we were in the spring of last year, it didn't really appear as if things were going to get much better. And every attempt uh, to put the relationship between Washington and Beijing on a better footing, there was always something to set it back. And that really only changed towards the end of last year when Xi Jinping was in San Francisco and had a meeting with Joe Biden. And since then, you have seen this uh, you know, quite intense contact between the two sides. You've seen uh, you know, a number of high-level visits uh, to China from U.S. officials, most recently Janet Yellen for the second time in the year, and also Anthony Blinken and various others. And you've also importantly seen military-to-military uh, -military contacts uh, uh, coming back. And that's important because uh, U.S. Uh, aircraft fly very close to the Chinese coast in the South China Sea. And you, you had, when they weren't talking to each other, a lot of these near misses 
uh, between Chinese and uh, US aircraft. And, and one of these could have led to an accident that could have had catastrophic consequences. And you haven't had any of these for the last few months. And that's because the two sides are talking to one another. The issues remain the uh, you know the same uh, fundamental issues. Uh, you know, uh, the differences between China and the US are, are, are more or less as they were. And there are a few new ones like the future of TikTok in the United States. But at the same time, at least they are talking, and there's, uh, you know, there's a really, really, you can feel here the difference just because of the fact that the two sides, uh, you have much more contact, not just at a high level, but also at lower levels, academics, think tanks, business people. There's much more going on than there had been, than there was a year ago. About a year ago, too, Ursula von der Leyen made her speech about China, and this was the speech in which she introduced the idea of de-risking, and really she uh, she was signaling a much more robust European policy towards China. Uh, the Chinese uh, reacted badly to that speech, but... Uh, over the months, one of the things that uh, that did happen, I mean, at that, around that time, we were still dealing with a lot of the effects of what had happened during the COVID period, when China was isolated uh, from the rest of the world and was very sensitive to criticism and was still in the grip of this uh, so-called wolf warrior diplomacy, which involved really uh, a very uh, strong and immediate and harsh response to any kind of slight or insult. And so there were all kinds of spats going on with uh, the European Union, uh, with Lithuania because of uh, a particular uh, Taiwan representative office that opened in Vilnius, and then also the sanctioning of a number of members of the European Parliament. And there were disputes over uh, China's human rights record, as well as the usual economic disputes. So you had this very tense relationship going on. Since then, China has engaged in something of a charm offensive or has tried to do so. The de-risking uh, conversation has continued to happen in Europe, but, uh, but Olaf Scholz was here in China this week, and it was uh, notable that he really hardly mentioned de-risking, and that uh, in a way the conversation appears to have moved, uh, shifted slightly over to a more traditional kind of, uh, of dialogue between China and the European Union, which is about trade and competition. And uh, the European Union uh, suggesting that China is subsidizing its industries uh, in such a way that uh, creates unfair competition, but that, uh, you, you know, uh, and China then complaining about, uh, about being unfairly picked on. But these are, in a way, this is territory that both China and the European Union are quite comfortable on. And so, uh, you know, so it remains to be seen just exactly how this de-risking uh, debate goes. But it appears for now that the national security element of that dialogue appears to be diminishing uh, and the straightforward trade element appears to be more in the forefront as we're talking now. That obviously could change. Uh, what was very much on the agenda both last year and also this week when uh, Olaf Scholz was here was the war in Ukraine. And Europe, once again, asking China to use its influence on Vladimir Putin uh, to ask him essentially to end the war, to withdraw from Ukraine. Uh, and China, uh, it, 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 there's been a bit of a shift in a way in the, in the way China speaks about this. China is officially neutral on the war, but it has given throughout diplomatic and uh, economic support to uh, to Russia. It hasn't delivered any weapons to Russia, but the uh, Ukraine's allies uh, are concerned about uh, what they view as dual use technology, which is being uh, sent from uh, from China to Russia, or they're worried that it might be. And uh, and last year, about again this time last year, uh, China proposed a 12-point peace proposal. And the Western powers weren't very interested in hearing about it. And they uh, basically dismissed it. And they dismissed other peace proposals as well from the African Union. Now uh, that the West is quite interested in China, uh, you know, uh, coming into the picture where peace plans and peace proposals are concerned, if you speak to Chinese officials now about this issue, they're more inclined to say, well, um, this is really not exactly our conflict. You know, the Russians would like us to be more involved in their side. You'd like us to be more involved in your side. But really, it's for the parties themselves to deal with this. And so there's been a kind of a, you know, something of a shift. And again, when uh, Scholz met Xi Jinping, 
uh, yesterday, they, uh, uh, you know, uh, Schultz was kind of speaking about it with a certain sense of urgency, whereas uh, Xi Jinping was saying, well, you know, in due course, uh, there will be an international conference. We hope that will involve both parties. And so, uh, so, uh, so there's a, you know, a, a difference in tone there. Um, you did have uh, last year around this time, at the same time as you had the, uh, you know, uh, the economy appearing not to come back uh, from, uh, you know, not to recover in the same way as it might, as we might have hoped. You also had uh, almost exactly a year ago the Shanghai Auto Show, and at the Shanghai Auto Show, a lot of companies from the West, car companies, they went to uh, Shanghai for the first time in a number of years, and they were astonished not to see that the Chinese were producing electric vehicles, but they were producing them so well. And one person from a German car company who was there last year told me afterwards that going from one of the German company's showrooms into one of the Chinese company's showrooms was like going from a string quartet uh, into a nightclub. And that it was just, uh, you know, the dynamism of, of the Chinese uh, uh, manufacturers was something which appeared to to take everybody by surprise. But in fact, obviously, China's success in the electric vehicles in that production, which is now they've become the world's leading uh, producer and exporter of these uh, products, is the result of an industrial policy in China, which involved uh, 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 state decisions to roll out infrastructure, to support companies, and to focus efforts on a number of technologies. And this uh, is what is now called here in China, new productive forces. And this is all really about the idea that uh, the China's economic future depends on moving its economic model of shifting from investment into you know, in, in things like uh, construction, property, infrastructure into uh, high tech uh, manufacturing. And we're talking about things like uh, green energy technology solar panels, electric vehicles, various other things, also life sciences, artificial intelligence, and semiconductors. And this is all fine as far as China is concerned, but of course it creates a conflict with China's uh, trading partners, notably in the European Union. And the European Union and the US are haunted by the memory of what happened uh, some years ago, the so-called China shock, when what you had was this flood of uh, Chinese, cheap uh, Chinese imports, which helped to uh, reduce inflation in those Western countries, but the, it also basically wiped out a number of industries in, uh, in rather crucial parts of the US and also in parts of Europe. And many people in uh, the West believe that that experience helped to fuel the rise of Donald Trump, right-wing populists in Europe as well. They don't want to see that happening. Janet Yellen very explicitly last week said, we're not going to allow it to happen. And so now you see this conflict between China and uh, the West about uh, the, the West accusing China of overcapacity uh, in manufacturing and basically worry that, uh, that subsidized goods are going to come flooding onto the market in Europe and in the United States. So that's where the, uh, the conflict is going to, to be seen. Where Taiwan is concerned, uh, they had a, a elections, presidential elections uh, in January, and the result of that was a result that nobody really wanted. China wanted anybody but uh, uh, William Lai, who was the candidate of the uh, Taiwan Progressive Party. They wanted anybody but him to win. He wanted to win, which he did win, but unfortunately for him, he won with 40% of the vote. The opposition was divided. So 60% of the people voted for candidates who oppose uh, the current uh, Taiwanese government's approach to cross-strait relations. So the other two candidates have got 60%. They wanted a more emollient approach to relations with Beijing. And, uh, and so, uh, this is, you know, so in a sense, this was a result that nobody wanted, but actually that everybody could live with. And what you've seen since then, there were a lot. There was a lot of concern before the election that uh, that if William Lai won, that Beijing might respond with some kind of saber rattling, like the military exercises that we saw last year. Uh, but in fact, there hasn't been anything like that. And instead, it's all been pretty calm. Uh, we'll see what happens when William Lai is inaugurated next month, and what he says and what China says in response. But for now, it appears that both sides are keeping the temperature down and that and so that uh, what's happened there in a way has worked out 
rather better than we might have hoped for. What happened in nearby in the South China Sea is uh, much more worrying. And so what you've seen now is a flashpoint with the Philippines. And this is uh, a, a dispute over uh, what is a, a, a kind of a rock in the middle of the South China Sea called the Second Thomas Shoal. And on this rock uh, is uh, grounded a World War II uh, naval vessel called the Sierra Madre. And this uh, vessel has been kind of decomposing over the years, but it's important to the Philippines because they uh, have, they believe that you know by having this thing there that, that uh, reinforces their claim to this particular spot. It's not exactly an island, but it's uh, it, it's it's something in the middle of the South China Sea. China claims practically the whole of the South China Sea as its territorial waters. It has this what it calls the Nine Dash Line. An international court in 2016 said the Chinese claims are groundless, that it uh, that that what it calls islands are not actually islands. But nonetheless, what's been happening is that the uh, Philippines have been sending uh, uh, troops over there, and they've been kind of trying to uh, to shore up this vessel, and the troops uh, need to be resupplied. And as they're being resupplied, the Chinese Coast Guard has been attacking them uh, with a high-powered water cannon, and this has all become. Uh, now a very uh, fraught matter. It's been complicated in the last few days by a revelation that the previous uh, Philippines president, Duterte, gave a private assurance to the Chinese that, the, uh, that uh, they wouldn't change the status quo and so that they wouldn't try to rebuild this uh, vessel or to kind of build a more solid structure on this rock. And so that's kind of confused matters. But nonetheless, this is a dangerous uh, conflict that's worrying all of China's neighbors and the neighbors in, the, uh, you know, in that whole area, many of whom also have claims to the South China Sea. And that also has become a flashpoint between the US and China. Finally, I wanted to mention Hong Kong. And in Hong Kong, as you will recall, after the uh, pro-democracy demonstrations in 2019, uh, China, Beijing imposed uh, a national security law, which is a draconian law, uh, on uh, Hong Kong, and this saw hundreds of people arrested. The uh, the law has a presumption against bail, and so if you're arrested, you immediately go to jail. The trials take a long time, and there's a hundred percent conviction rate so far. And so, uh, what, but but what uh, was not quite clear in 2020 was where. Uh, China and the Hong Kong authorities were going to go because there was a certain vagueness really about what the red lines were. What became clear very quickly was that all political dissent was going to be snuffed out, uh, any kind of formal opposition. But there were various moments where things have, could have gone either way. And unfortunately, at each of those moments, things have gone in the harsher way. So for example, in December of last year, there were elections to the local councils in Hong Kong. These are, uh, are functions which have you know, very, very little political power. They're really very, very local. And a small number of the former pro-democracy uh, uh, politicians wanted to run uh, for election there, and the authorities barred every one of them from doing so. And so you've also then uh, more recently had the uh, had the introduction of a new uh, local national security law under Article 23 of the Basic Law, which is the uh, sort of quasi-constitution that has governed Hong Kong since 1997 and has returned to China. And this bill was rushed through the legislature, and it is harsher than uh, it uh, the, you know, than uh, than was hoped for or than was expected, with new powers. And so that, again, I think has surprised, shall we say, on the downside. And then also uh, Hong Kong has uh, an independent judiciary. It uh, operates under a common law system. And once again, although the judges have shown some signs of life from time to time in opposing the authorities, generally speaking, they have uh, gone along and imposed harsh sentences and found almost in every case uh, against uh, the opposition. And so, uh, you know, so, so what's happening there is something which uh, I think, uh, you know, given that there was some leeway, it's disappointing. But I think it's important to say that Hong Kong remains 
different from mainland China. It's not just that they have independent financial institutions and regulators, but it's also that life there is different. You can, uh, you know, there is no great firewall. You can go on the internet freely. You can walk down the street and buy the Financial Times, the New York Times, or the Economist. Uh, you know, there is also an independent media. It's a very small, very uh, poorly funded. These people uh, have practically no money. They're also very careful about what they do. They don't uh, criticize the authorities. There's no political uh, criticism in there. And they're very careful about the stories they do. But they do things like court reports, just as is conducted in public in Hong Kong. And they do things like uh, they report on planning. They, they do things that are part of, uh, that keep going part of the sort of the civic life of Hong Kong. And that area of difference between Hong Kong and mainland China is an area of difference which many people in Hong Kong who uh, are obviously uh, mourning the loss of a lot of their freedoms over the last few years, they believe that that's something that is worth preserving. And I think, and this I will end with, those people, like those journalists uh, there, they're very realistic about what the limits are, but they are not despairing. And if they're not despairing, I don't think we should either. And with that, I take your questions. This podcast is brought to you by the IIEA. Sharing ideas, shaping policy.